Hello my friends and welcome back to my channel. Okay, so I have had this video idea just sort of recently just kind of popped into my brain and it wouldn't leave me alone. So I decided that I'm going to do a series of videos all about what makes good writing from a reader's point of view. This is not for authors. This is not for writers. This is for people who are readers and what they want and by they I mean this is what I want, from the writing in the books that they read. I thought this would be a really fun series to make for people who are talking about books, who are reviewing books, who want to sort of dive in deeper to see what makes good writing for a reader. So the first episode is going to be about prose. Now prose is something that I deeply love. I have a deep appreciation for prose. I love it so dearly. I think that if you have studied poetry or any type of classic literature, you probably have a good love for prose, but prose is also something that you can love in any subgenre or genre of books. And I am a romance reader, if you are new to my channel, if you somehow stumbled across this, and I am passionate about talking about how powerful romance novels are and that they are more than just the trash that sort of mainstream society thinks that they are. So one thing that I want to be clear about before we get into talking about what makes good prose is that when I'm reading a book, when I pick up a book to read, I never ever go into it with like a checklist thinking to myself it has to meet all of these obligations for it to have good prose for me to consider that this is a good book. You know what I mean? I only start thinking about prose if I come across some that moves me deeply, or if I'm starting to not enjoy the book, if I find myself checking out, if I'm not really able to pay attention, if I'm not vibing with the writing itself, it's just kind of rubbing me the wrong way, I will almost first, always first go to look at the pros and see what's bothering me there. So. I just wanted to be clear that when I'm reading, I don't just have this in my head, but when a book doesn't work for me or something works really, really well, I love being able to pinpoint what that is. So one of the best ways to describe prose, prose is really just words. It's the words that a writer uses to tell a story that's not poetry. So it's the writing, it's the sentences, it's how the words flow together. That's what prose is. Something that I think is really interesting is that most writers, probably almost all writers, never set out to write a book because of this line of prose that they have. That usually isn't the generating idea behind writing a book. Usually it's some type of a scene that they see, characters they want to develop, or a story idea that they have. However, from a reader's point of view, often prose is the first thing that is either going to convince us to continue reading or to stop reading. And for that reason, I feel like prose is really, really important. And even if it's invisible, which is for a lot of people, the best possible way to have prose in a book. So let's talk about that for a minute. Brandon Sanderson is a fantasy writer, and he is very, very popular, very well known. He's an excellent writer. Something he's known for that is pretty widely well known is that his prose is not beautiful, it's not flowery, it's almost very plain. And he has used this analogy, which I think is really, really smart, and I'm going to share with you here, that he considers prose to be like there are different basically two different types of prose there's one prose where it's just like a window a clear window and you as the reader are looking through that glass window into the world that the writer has set up for you out there so there's nothing obscuring your view you can just see it perfectly all that that prose is doing is getting you the story so it's invisible in a way it's just a vehicle to get you to tell the story and that's probably what most people want out of prose that's what i want when i just want to consume a story i want the prose to be invisible i want to just fall into the storytelling and enjoy my time there there is another type of prose. Now I'm I'm generalizing the far sides of the extreme here. Another type of prose is like a stained glass window approach where when you're right next to that stained glass window, it's very difficult to see through it to see the story the author is trying to tell. But when you stand back a little bit and you look through it, you can see the story on the other side of the window the author is trying to tell and you can see it embellished or you can see it in a different light because of the stained glass effect. So that's sort of an analogy for prose that is beautiful, descriptive, not necessarily flowery, but really evocative prose. And that's often what you will find in literary fiction. And the invisible type is what you'll find in like commercial fiction. Now there can be a blend of the two and that's my favorite type of prose to read. So 
So something that I am looking for in what I think makes good prose is, first of all, readability. How readable is this prose? How easy is it for me to slip into the story? Am I getting caught up in the words the author is using, the sentence structure, are there grammatical errors, or is it just very readable, very easy to get into? So that's the first thing that I look for. And something that I think makes prose readable is to have very clear, concise, sentences. So they're not full of too many words. It's not trying to wow you with a big vocabulary. It doesn't look like somebody just opened the thesaurus and pointed, you know, picked out a bunch of words. I think that oftentimes authors are told to keep their prose shorter than it needs to be, to make it succinct, to make it concise, to keep it tight, to keep it lean. And Hemingway is often brought up in that discussion because he's famous for that. He's famous for having short, concise, clear sentences that really tell his story in a bold, straightforward way. But I personally really love prose to be beautiful too, to convey more than just what you're seeing on the surface that lets you in on the emotions of the characters or some other type of insight into the situation. So prose for me is the most beautiful when it's able to strike an almost perfect balance of familiar and unfamiliar. So it has something that's familiar to us that makes it easy for us to relate to this, that feels something like we have experienced in our real life. And I like the unfamiliar to be there because it sort of catches us off guard. It shows us something that we would not have anticipated any other way, something that we had not thought of before. The author put it in there. It's a little bit surprising. It's a little bit unfamiliar. And when those two things meet up, the familiar, something that rings true to our own experiences combined with the unfamiliar, that just is beautiful to me. And that is my favorite type of prose. And I think that goes with storytelling as well. I love familiar stories, but I love them to have something unexpected and surprising in there. So the unfamiliar is something that isn't just full of like the anachronistic style that we are so used to hearing in our everyday life, the dead metaphors, things that we always hear, cliches, things like that. So unfamiliar. So a really good example of this, this is a very well-known example. This is mentioned all the time for beautiful prose. So you may have heard this before, but if you haven't, or even if you have, I want you to stop and think and do this little exercise with me. It's just, it's just really quick. So I'm gonna read this prose from a book. This is from a classic. And I'm gonna stop and I want you to fill it in with what you think will come next, okay? Here I go. Until I feared I would lose it, I never loved to read. One does not. Now I want you to think about what, now just off the top of your head, what do you think could go in there? What is the easiest thing that you think of, the first thing that you think of to put in there? Okay, now I'm going to read you the whole quote and I want you to see if you think it was different or not. Until I feared I would lose it, I never loved to read. One does not love breathing. This is from to Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I love this quote. I think this is an excellent example of exactly what I was talking about, where we have some very concise, succinct prose in here. Very, it's not flowery. It's not full of a lot of words, but it's familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. Like I was not expecting the first time I re read that to hear one does not love breathing because they're talking about reading, fear that he had never feared losing the ability to read. And he compares that right alongside, or she compares that right alongside with, one does not love breathing. I thought that was so clever. It really hit me. And I think that is some powerful prose when it's conveyed in a few simple words, but it has a great emotional impact. And I think that this is very difficult to do. <laughs> like putting in a lot of words is not difficult, but trying to pare down your words to still carry an emotional impact is really hard to do. So I love that example. Another example that I have, I have two examples from classic books and then I have some examples from modern day romances. So this is from The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. He says, for a moment, the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me forward breathlessly as I listened. Then the glow faded, each light deserting her with lingering regret, like, so I want you to think of the first thing that you can think of. What would you compare that to in your mind? What would be the best possible comparison that you could think? Now, when I ask you these things, it's usually because our brains go to what is most familiar to us. 
And the thing that makes prose like this stand out and be beautiful is that it's surprising. It uses a comparison or it uses words and descriptions that we're not expecting because they don't go for that off the top of your head response. Now I'm gonna read you the complete quote. For a moment the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me forward breathlessly. As I listened, then the glow faded, each light deserting her with lingering regret, like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. I loved that so much because you can instantly feel that moment of children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. You're probably thinking about your childhood summers and when you had to come in at night and how you had like this melancholy feel like you didn't want this moment to be over. And I love the way that he added that in there when he's actually talking about Daisy. So something else that makes prose really beautiful is when prose and poetry collide, when there's some type of a disturbance, when it has something to do with the cadence of the words, how it feels when you're reading it in your mind, how it feels when you're reading it out loud, there's some blend here of poetry and prose meeting together, and that's often described as lyrical prose. So what makes prose really beautiful to me isn't... The, so we're not talking about plot, a fascinating plot. We're not talking about great characters. We're not talking about moral, political messages. We are talking about singular instances of rhythmic upset in the words that are used. This is what makes prose beautiful. So here is some examples of that. So this one is sensory prose, combining the familiar with the unfamiliar again. This is some hopes were weeds, easy to eradicate with a yank and a pull. Some, however, were vines, fast growing, tenacious, impossible to clear. I think that when you read that out loud, you can even see the syllables, how they sound together, but also the way that this makes you feel. When she's talking about hopes, how some of them are like weeds, easy to get rid of, just with a yank and a pull. And some of them are like vines. They're so fast growing, you can't get rid of them. And I think that this is such a really beautiful and insightful piece of prose, because all it's talking about is hopes, and it's comparing them to weeds, some that are easy to kill and some that aren't. And I like that combination of hope that is usually thought of to be so bright, shining, happy, hopeful, but the way that they describe it here is with things that are hard to kill or things that are easy to kill. And I thought that was very clever. And that comes from one of my favorite romance writers, and that is Sherry Thomas. Comes from this book, Ravishing the Heiress. A lot of the plot in here was a miss for some readers, but I love this book. And one of the reasons I love it is because it has so many shining examples of her prose just like that, that combine this familiar with unfamiliar, the comfortable with something that's uncomfortable in a way that makes you deeply feel the emotions that she's trying to get you to feel in this book. Sherry Thomas is one of my favorite writers. I think that she is a master at prose, and I have another quote of hers coming up. So this quote is also from Ravishing the Heiress. She says, Perhaps unrequited love was like a specter in the house, a presence that brushed at the edge of senses, a heat in the dark, a shadow under the sun. And again, she does that same thing, where she combines the familiar, the comfortable, the warm feeling of love, but because she's talking about unrequited love, she sort of balances that right alongside those things that are scary. That darkness, that shadow, that heat in the dark, that presence that brushes at the edge of your senses. I think she's really, through just those two very brief sentences, what she's doing is she's telling me, or she's trying to make me feel uncomfortable, while at the same time hoping that things are going to work out. And I think that people who didn't like that would say that she did that, didn't like this book, would say she probably did that really well because there is a big sense of feeling uncomfortable in this book because you don't want her to have unrequited love forever. You want her to have her love. So now I'm going to also talk about a modern day romance writer who does prose the best that I have ever read in my life. I think that she is probably hands down, not probably, she is hands down the best romance writer writing right now for many, many reasons. But one of the reasons that I love her is because of her prose. And something that she does with her prose really well is she uses rhythmic prose so that it almost feels like poetry. She does that blend of poetry and prose really well where it falls into lyrical and there is this cadence to the words and a way that really hits your senses full force. So I'm going to share a quote from Real to show you what I mean. 
She says, it's not an existential question of immortality, of living forever, but a challenge of numbered days and what we do with what we have. It's not a string of todays that become yesterdays and aspire to tomorrow, but living like there is no guarantee, living with an urgency to say what needs to be said, do what needs to be done, to no matter what, live with what you leave behind in mind. And I think when you read that out loud, you can see how she wrote the GRIP trilogy because GRIP is a rapper. She wrote the poetry that's in GRIP. You see that this woman is a master at using every single tool in her arsenal to convey emotion through her words. And I love how rhythmic that sounded, the, the way that the syllables blend together and how powerful that makes it feel. I just adore it so much. So now this next quote is does the same type of thing it has rhythmic prose but i think that the feeling it creates here is a little different it's not sort of like abrupt where you're talking about living like it's your last that sort of almost urgency that you felt from the previous quote like this one feels more languid and i'm i'm wondering if maybe you will feel that too when i read it so this quote comes from still the last book in the grip trilogy and she says we feel the things we need to know instead of say them with my chest pressed to his back forgiveness love understanding and tenderness transfer noiselessly between the layers of our clothes an emotional osmosis through blood and bone through hurt and fear like the way that she's using words to describe the way that they are feeling, that deep, all-consuming love, like osmosis, getting that close to someone, her chest to his back, like bone, all of those visual imagery, like it's a powerful, powerful sentence. And it's not really overly wordy. It is conveying a very strong emotional response and powerful. She's incredible. She, uh, there, like I picked two quotes that really tried to convey the idea I was talking about, but her books are just full of words that make you just stop and think and be like, what? What sorcery did I just read? This is amazing. So this video is not meant to be all inclusive. And I should have stated earlier that a lot of what we like in prose is subjective. What one person likes is not necessarily what the other person is going to like. Some people don't want beautiful, flowery prose. I don't think I really shared any examples of flowery prose. I didn't really get into talking about purple prose, flowery prose, things like that. I was just sharing with you examples of prose that I find to be powerful. Flowery prose I feel like can go really well or really poorly. Sometimes I think younger authors will try flowery prose when they'll just try to use all kinds of adjectives and adverbs and throw all these words in there to try and make you feel things. But when I talked earlier about some of the best prose is really concise, tight, really editing themselves and using words sparingly, using words with intention. And I think sometimes flowery prose can really evade that message and it just sort of ends up being watered down and you tune it out usually. And that's similar to, I would call flowery prose and purple prose pretty much the same thing. It's just an abundance of description, probably more words than necessary. It doesn't mean that it's bad. If you love purple prose, if you love flowery prose, that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that that's your preference. So with everything that we like in prose, there's going to be it's subjective. It's what one person likes. It's going to be different from what another person likes. I do, however, think there are rules, <laughs> some rules, and they can always be broken. I mean, Cormac McCarthy is a really great example. I adore his book, The Road. He broke so many rules in there, run on sentences, no punctuation, but it's powerful. You know, it's powerful, beautiful words that convey his message, that dire feeling in that book. One of my favorite books of all time, but we're talking about romance books, but that is a really good example of an author who broke all the rules and they worked. So it can happen for sure. I wanna keep this video fairly short. So now briefly, I'm gonna go over some things that I think are things that make prose bad, things that turn me off when I'm reading books. So I talked about all the things that I like, things that make me just feel so happy. Now I have a very short list of prose faults, things that make me just like, not like, not like the book, things that make me wanna DNF, things that make me wanna give up on this author's writing unless I find this in a very, very, very early book of that author's and they are still writing, I'll usually give them a second chance because most of the time, author's skill grows, almost always. And I love that so much. So some things, some obvious things that make prose bad are obviously bad grammar, right? That's sort of a red flag. It happens 
less frequently, I would say hardly, not very frequently with published, with traditionally published books. It can happen with indie romance books. Usually, if an indie romance author is going to succeed, they get a handle on this pretty quickly. Sentence structure is another one. Sometimes you'll have too many run-on sentences. Sometimes you'll have people who don't know how to use uh, punctuation very well. And I'm not by any means saying that I'm an expert at this, but I am saying that I can see it. <laughs> and it diminishes my enjoyment of reading this book. A big one for me is cliches. So earlier when I was talking about the examples from To Kill a Mockingbird and The Great Gatsby, one of the reasons I mentioned those is because I was sort of baiting you to fill that in with a cliche, something that you know you could have filled that in with, with phrases that we hear over and over again. And instead that author chose to use words that were unique, that made you think a different way, that made you feel that exact feeling they wanted you to feel, but it went in a way that you weren't expecting it. So something that is always disappointing to me is when I come across cliches in writing like that. Something that we've heard over and over again, like it was hot as Hades outside, or like her eyes were sparkled like the sea, like things like that. Those tend to be cliches because we just hear them so often that we kind of, a lot of the time I feel like we can kind of tune that out and just make that as white noise. But if it's a lot, it draws our attention and that's when we start to get frustrated. And by we, I mean me. Now this one kind of goes hand in hand with the flowery prose taken to another level and that's overly wordy descriptions. Words, writing that is overwrought is writing that is trying too hard. It has too many words. It's like overworked, you know? When an author throws in a lot of big words into a sentence, usually what that tells me is that this is a pretty inexperienced author and they haven't quite figured out how to convey the emotion they want to without trying to use a lot of big words to try and make them maybe sound smart or to make you feel a certain way. This is why I really love nuance in my books is because it implies that this author trusts the reader to pick up what they're putting down, to understand the message that they're conveying without spelling everything out for you, being overly descriptive. You know, we don't need to know all the description in the room, especially if it doesn't have anything to do with moving the story forward, which it usually doesn't. Okay, this one is a big one for me, and it is passive verbs. Passive, you can sometimes hear this referred to as passive voice, when things are described with verbs that are very passive. So like, the water was cold. Instead of saying the water was cold, something you could say is, goosebumps erupted on my skin as soon as I touched the chilled water. Now, obviously I'm not a writer. That was just something off the top of my head, but that conveys a much different feeling than saying the water was cold. When you say something in a passive verb like was, it removes you from it. So it doesn't feel immediate. So whatever they're describing, whatever they're trying to get out of you emotionally, it removes you from it because it's not happening in the moment right now. And that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the tense of the book. It doesn't have to be in like present tense but by consistently using was or passive verbs like that, it removes you from what's happening in the book. And that usually means that you're not gonna emotionally connect with the characters, you're not gonna emotionally connect with the book and you just really don't care. So if I see this happening a lot, that's usually a point where I'm checking out of the book and I'll DNF it. <laughs> now, I did talk about this one a little bit earlier with Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> I love, I love that man. I think he's a fantastic writer. But this one is run on sentences that are not deliberate. So sometimes in, I would say almost usually in literary fiction, some authors, Cormac McCarthy, will use this as a technique to convey a certain type of feeling. They want to get a feeling from you in that scene, in that moment with these words. Sometimes in an inexperienced writer's hand, they will do run on sentences because they're trying to get the idea is all down on paper and they're not quite sure how to break it up or how to use less words, you know? So run on sentences lead to a feeling of the pace being slow. It makes the book feel like it's dragging because it's not concise, it's not getting to the point. Now, all of this that I've been talking about in this video, this is all just about the bones of the words, the words that are used to tell the story. This is the vehicle to get you invested in the plot and the characters. And even if there really isn't a plot to speak of, 
words still carry a lot of weight and importance for how this author is going to get you invested in this character's life to take you along on their journey. For some, for whatever reason, this author has invited you to look at this person or this group of people, look at this moment in their life and share in this experience. So it always makes me ask myself, like, why do I care about this? Are these words doing what the author wants it to do? Do I, are these words making it so I care about this story? That's what prose does. Prose needs to be able to do its job. It needs to get you as the reader invested in these characters, in their lives, in this story, in this moment. And if you are the type of reader who wants clear glass without words that maybe are beautiful or too descriptive, you know, I, I feel like that is my default reading mode. I don't want to have the writing draw attention to itself. I want the clear glass. I just want the story. Or maybe you're the reader who wants to look through a stained glass window. And I definitely have periods where I'm like, I want to sink my teeth into something and I want to have something to read that's going to make me think. I want to have words that are going to make me feel. Those are two different feelings. And maybe you're a mix of both, or maybe you're just one or the other. But the point with this video was just to talk about prose, words, and why they make us love a book or DNF a book. So hopefully this video was successful. I tried to keep it concise. <laughs> I don't know that I did a good job, but um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you came along and watched it with me and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And uh, yeah, let's have a chat down in the comments. If you made it this far and you'd like to let me know you were here, please feel free to leave me a purple heart. Thank you so much, my friends. I am sure glad to have you here with me, and I'll see you in my next video.